So welcome, friends, colleagues, distinguished guests. My name is Diana Olbaum, and I chair the board of the Center for International Policy, which is hosting today's event. I am just absolutely delighted to see you all uh, as we open this conference exploring the role of the progressive movement in shaping US foreign policy. Every day, there is growing evidence that a major paradigm shift is needed in US foreign policy. Between the wars in Gaza and Ukraine, the militarization of the US border, the rising tension with Iran and China, and the failure to meaningfully address the climate crisis, it's clear we need to take a different path towards peace, justice, and sustainability. The purpose of this conference is to develop and share common sense solutions to address the most urgent threats to our planet, war, corruption, inequality, and climate change. Now, as I look around the room, I see many of you who have worked closely with CIP over the years, and many others who perhaps are not so familiar with CIP. So I'd like to start by just saying a few words about CIP's history. The Center for International Policy has been working for a more just and peaceful world for nearly half a century. We were born in the basement of Mott House in 1975, established by three young anti-Vietnam War activists who wanted to make sure the lessons of the war were not forgotten. One of our first big victories was the enactment of legislation that so many of you are familiar with, uh, prohibiting aid to governments that engage in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. Representatives Tom Harkin and Don Frazier, who were then the congressional leaders on human rights and chief sponsors of that amendment, were then also the co-chairs of CIP's board. In the 1980s, CIP launched a successful campaign to require the US to oppose IMF loans to apartheid South Africa until minority rule was ended. During those years, CIP also helped lay the groundwork for the ARIAS Peace Plan, which concluded in 1987 with the signing of a historic peace agreement signed by all five Central American government presidents. We later worked to restore US diplomatic relations with Vietnam and normalize US relations with Cuba, taking delegations of legislators and business executives to those countries to build mutual understanding and promote reconciliation. CIP also served as a fiscal sponsor for several organizations that later spun off on their own, including Win Without War and the Financial Transparency Coalition. So that's where we've come from, and I couldn't possibly be more excited about where we are now and where we're headed. In 2022, we had the great fortune to convince Nancy O'Kale to serve as our new president and CEO. We knew that she would bring with her not only profound wisdom and talent as a thinker, speaker, leader, and advocate, but also an incredibly inspiring personal story. Before coming to the United States in 2012, Nancy directed Freedom House's program in Egypt, where she was convicted and sentenced to prison in a widely publicized case for allegedly using foreign funds to foment unrest. She was exonerated by a court ruling in December of 2018 and the great personal risk and sacrifice she took to shed light on a corrupt and abusive regime demonstrates her profound courage and her unshakable commitment to justice. As the first woman to head CIP in its nearly 50 year history, Nancy brought decades of relevant experience and a bold vision against racism and militarism in US foreign policy. She previously served as executive director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, which she built from the ground up into an internationally renowned policy research organization. Under Nancy's leadership, CIP has become a far more powerful and visionary organization. She has attracted some of the most highly respected foreign policy experts in Washington, including our new executive vice president, Matt Duss, who previously served as the chief foreign policy advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders. 
to Together, Nancy and Matt have built a very strong team with the experience and the relationships to bring progressives together to build a common vision for the future. So we are just absolutely thrilled to have all of you here as partners in this work, and it is my great honor and pleasure now to introduce Nancy O'Kale. Um, thank you, Diana, so much, and I'm truly honored to be here and fortunate to work with you alongside you and our board. I appreciate your kind words about my role at CIP, but I'm merely standing on the shoulders of many incredibly inspiring and dedicated individuals who have championed this cause for decades, many of them are here, and I'm not just talking at the people who were at CIP, but every one of you. I'm privileged and honored to lead CIP, an organization I always brag that is the most progressive organization. They picked an ex-convict to lead the organization. <laughs> Cannot get more progressive than that. For those familiar with my story that Diana referred to, uh, as I wrote before, after my exoneration, when I was first locked in the courtroom cage during my trial in Egypt, my eyes caught a previous prisoner scribbling on the wall that read, if defending justice is a crime, then long live criminality. It is my mantra and a crime I am proud of, and I cherish the many partners in that crime that I had over the years. Some of them in this room, Rami Aoub is here, like my first partner in crime. And I'm most recently proud to my new partner in crime, Matt Duss, CIP's Executive Vice President. Those who know Matt know that his values and standards stand taller than his noticeable height. You can't miss it. It is with a sense of both urgency and hope that I welcome you today to this pivotal conference. We are here not just to discuss foreign policy, but to reimagine it, clarify what it means to pursue a progressive foreign policy and what we can do together to advance it. As Diana mentioned, we are long overdue for a paradigm shift to address the dysfunctional and harmful system that has led us to war, climate change, inequality, and has perpetuated corruption and authoritarianism. These are the issues that shaped our priorities at CIP, and I'm gonna tell you why. As we sit, sit here in this safe room, Civilians in Gaza are being bombarded for the fifth months in a row in a disproportionate and indiscriminate response to the tragic attacks by Hamas on October 7th of last year. We have now reached a staggering death toll of 20, 27,000 humans, in addition to the 1,200 Israelis who also died during the, due to the attacks. Similarly, Others in Ukraine face threats from the extended war since Russia's invasion in 2022. We are not mere witnesses to such human catastrophes. We are participants. Some directly implicated, others by silence in fear of consequences. It's a collective failure of humanity. We are all responsible. But perhaps our biggest failure is our inability to honestly challenge the systems and mindsets that have created this dismal picture of the world. Nearing the end of the first quarter of the 21st century, the picture is bleak. And the US has played a significant role in shaping this. 
Despite remarkable advancements in science and technology, um, we can fairly say that ultranationalism, inequality, hypermilitarization have become worrying overarching characteristics of this century. Global crises like the pandemic and climate change are devastating in their own right, but they also magnify our inherent structural problems, particularly inequality, racism, and the impact of corruption, elite capture, and authoritarianism around the world. Figures from last year present an undeniable picture of where we stand. In 2023, the United States ranked 43rd in the Gender Parity Index, falling 16 slots from the previous year. At the bottom of the list of the global index is Afghanistan, now deemed as the most repressive country for women and children by the UN, following the Taliban's takeover after two decades of US involvement. Let that sink in as we reflect on our global engagements. On the corruption front, the situation is no better. The 2023 Corruption Perception Index shows that global corruption is on the rise. 23 countries fell to their lowest score last year. Much like the pandemic disproportionately impact the poor and the marginalized, corruption most severely affects those with the least access to basic necessities, while elite exploit justice systems. After a period of improvement in income inequality gap in the income inequality gap in 2018, that trend that trend has since reversed. Income inequality has risen, and in the United States and other countries such as China, India, and Russia. Meanwhile, the U.S. defense and arms sales have seen staggering expansions, with the U.S. maintaining its position as the world's highest arms exporter. The correlation with increased violence is clear. Even before Gaza's conflict, the Institute for Economics and Peace Annual Global Index reported that over 238,000 people died in global conflicts in 2022. This marked 96% increase from previous years. The US is once again involved militarily in the Middle East following its withdrawal from a two decade long engagement in Afghanistan. Over the weekend, the United States has conducted bombings in Yemen, Iraq, and in Syria. The hard fact is that these events are not merely happening to us, like earthquakes or pandemics. We are all deeply implicated. To be brutally honest, even those among us striving to leverage our best tool, US domestic laws, international humanitarian law, and aid conditionality, have not been immune to the dominant power dynamics that catalyzed these situations initially. This issue extends beyond military industrial complex. It's about entrenched structural violence and the dominance of the security state paradigm. And I'm not ex excluding myself from that. Working through Congress, trying to employ our laws as safeguards against misuse of arms, I increasingly realize how we cannot legislate ourselves out of crises at least not just, as I find myself perpetually puzzled by the term misuse of arms. It conjures up an image in my mind of weaponry production packages adorned with a sticker saying, kill responsibly. There is, is fundamentally one use for arms, and that is to kill. They are not meant to sit in, in warehouses, nor stockpiles intended to serve as any purpose other than easy access for feeding the war machine, as we observe now in the conflict in Israel. We can employ as many euphemistic terms as we like to legitimize the killing, calling it defense or deterrence, but it does not alter the outcome. The discourse 
on the misuse of arms and legislation designed to regulate, to regulate it overlooks the reality of who holds power to decide who deserves to live and who deserves to, lie, to die, which delineates the proper and improper use of weapons. It is no secret who makes those decisions. It is those within the elite monopoly over foreign policy and their conformists. Again, working within the dominant security state paradigm. But we are not without options. We possess agency. None of this is inevitable. We have choices. But the one choice we do not have is to persist in operating within the flawed system that legitimizes and legalizes atrocities through flawed policy framings, such as arms for peace. These were the foundations of deals like the Abraham Accords in the Middle East. Look how that turned out. We also cannot afford to pretend that domestic and foreign affairs are separate. Nor can we mislead people into believing that national security is achievable without global security. Addressing global crisis necessitates domestic reform. Democracy begins to decline incrementally when we treat it merely as a set of electoral rituals, following them without question or challenge. If we have faith in the virtue of democracy, despite its imperfections, we should not treat it as if it were a dogmatic religion, merely carrying out rituals of democracy elections, trapped within a rotational cycle among a few elites on either side of the aisle. We should not wait for the shock of events like Trump's win to realize that we have a problem. Regardless of the outcomes of this year's election, the combination of elite capture, tribal politics, have long undermined our genuine pursuit for equitable, just society and a peaceful world. So what then are our choices? As progressives, our, pro our choices transcend the antiquated left-right divide, or one side of the aisle over the other. Our choices are between integrity and corruption, accountability and complicity, impunity and the rule of law, applicable on both sides of the aisle. Our decisions do not only pivot on ending wars, but more importantly, transforming the mindsets that led to them. It's about distinguishing between feeling good work and truly effective work, urging us to confront our flawed systems directly. Our foreign policy choices should not be trapped by false binaries between anti-imperialism and anti-authoritarianism. Opposing US, U.S. hegemony, great power competition, and the risk of unnecessary military escalation does not require us to excuse human rights violation committed by the Chinese government or similar others. The U.S. still can and should adopt a constructive role globally without restoring to hegemony. Meanwhile, we must dispel the naive misconception that relinquishing U.S. principles will actually lead to the, to the rise of powers that are aligned with us, given like the many that are rising right now or we're seeing on the global stage, like Russia and China, and even within the global south. To counter out to counteract the dangerous consequences of power competition, great power competition, our choices should not revolve around which governments should empower others, overpower others. Instead, we should focusing, focus on empowering people first, preventing their countries from becoming battlegrounds in states struggling for power. Looking at those issues I mean we understood and it became crystal clear <laughs> that we need a paradigm shift. And that helped us articulate what we call our 5R strategy for change. 
they are like a set of goals or set of approaches that we need to have in order to address the structural and problematic framing of US foreign policy. The first R is redrawing the stakeholder map. Who gets to sit on the table of foreign policy? Bringing in the views of those affected by US foreign policy to be part of it. And you can take a look at the work of my colleagues, Terrell Germain and Nigar and Mortazavi and their podcasts that brings really diverse voices into the, region, into the work that we do. Second, redefining security beyond the narrow lens of militarization and looking at the challenges that really lead to human insecurity, such as climate change. And again, I refer you to the work of my colleagues, Ari Tolani, Hannah Homestead, and Dave Aberson on our work on the Security Assistant Monitor and the Climate and Militarization Program and the Forum on Arms Trade. Third, reframe you as foreign policy and going beyond the great power competition or the foreign domestic divide. And fourth, and this is the most important and dear one to me, is restoring accountability both at home and abroad. Last year, many people were shocked by the news of the allegations that Senator Bob Menendez has received bribes from the Egyptian government. I was not shocked, but I was offended because when the Egyptian government tried to bribe me, they sent me a basket of mango to my office. <laughs> I was like, is this my price? <laughs> And finally, reviving diplomacy, but not in a rhetorical way. The reason why peace is getting a bad name and ceasefire is becoming a taboo, because in people's mind, this means just a halt. And that what happened before that is just water under the bridge. And that's why diplomacy should be directly based on the values of accountability. Because the truly frightening moment is not when we are not in power, but when we possess it and still fail to make a discernible difference. We can't afford to wait and we have no excuse to fail. With our talent, power and resilience, we are more than capable. Yet, resilience without a clear direction only lead to the depletion of energy and resources. We aspire at CIP to be a hub that clearly defined what progressive policy entails and build a community around it. We must challenge at all costs the belief that we can bomb our way to peace, as our friends from Win Without War, Steve and Sarah wrote last week. We also cannot legislate our way out of crises without addressing the fundamental systematic imbalances and elite capture in foreign policy. But our efforts should not be consumed by fighting back, but moving forward, driven by the proactive and like affirmative agenda and a new consensus. Most importantly, as we deliberate on our agenda and priorities, it's imperative to honestly confront the reality of trade-offs. They are plentiful in today's world. Acknowledging the cost involved is cru crucial, but we must discern which costs are bearable and which are not. No matter the expense, investing towards an achievable goal is infinitely more valuable than the futile attempt to amend irreversible damage. Lives that cannot be restored, injuries leaving children permanently disabled, and human catastrophes that history will judge us on. I wanted to paint a rosier picture to spotlight the good in the world and the good that Biden administration did, and indeed, there are plenty, but you can Google that for yourself. Because any achievement pales against the backdrop of catastrophic loss of life and our eroding humanity. Yet, here's the good news. You are here and you are brilliant. And we're here to debate, collaborate, and sculpt together a 
progressive agenda that resonates with our values and remarkable talent. This conversation did not start today and will not end here. It continues through our analytical work, convenings, and notably our newly launched international policy journal. Our clarity begins by identifying the roots of the problem and systemic imbalances, and ours are starkly clear. We need to face them bravely and honestly, and I'm honored to be doing that with you. Thank you so much.